Last spring. Please switch on the lights. So, I hope all of you had a great experience uh, witnessing Professor uh, Simon Marks and his journey to the law. Uh, now, the next thing is uh, we will have an official release of the Legal Studies Honors Program. And uh, I really thank you all to be a part of it. And I will request Professor Stephen Marks to release the brochure. All right, uh, as it was said, uh, we are today launching a new program known as Bachelor of Arts Honors in Legal Studies, specifically meant for people who want to have a stronger grounding in law even before they decide whether they want to become a lawyer or not. The purpose of this degree is to, you know, in many ways infuse interest among young people who may not have made up their mind to become a lawyer in their life, but the study of law can help them to decide whether they want to become a lawyer or not. And if they choose not to become a lawyer and end up doing other degrees, the knowledge of law will help them to pursue various walks of life, various study programs. Unique program, first of its kind in India. Many parts of the Western world has a program of this kind. So we're very fortunate that Professor Marx will be formally releasing the, uh, the launch of the program and the program brochure. I want to invite my colleagues who are here, who have worked hard. Can I request uh, Suruchi and uh, Vidhu Mahan? Uh, yeah. <laughs> the entire uh, office of admission for the law school. Uh, each one of them have contributed to this launch of this program. So I want to thank all of you. Uh, see, you can formally read. So, no, I want to understand that. A 
are you suggesting that uh, the laws that are intended to protect people who are vulnerable are affecting the law, affecting others? I mean, I want to understand your question. Yeah, I'm talking about the same thing that these laws for the protection of uh, the vulnerable people and the categories which are not uh, like untouchables at all. So these are somewhere restricting the rights of journey people too. How? Can you explain to me? I want to understand that. Because those are people, those laws are protecting uh, people who are themselves violated, they are suffering and so those are anti-discriminatory laws which are intended to make sure that they don't suffer. How is affecting people who are not suffering from discrimination? The main uh, right, when they get particular reservation for something. Yeah, so that's why I asked you. So you are talking about reservation, right? Yeah. Okay, good. That's, that was my first question. Thank you. So it's a very fair question and I'm going to ask him also to respond to the affirmative action uh, dilemmas in, uh, in the US. So I think it's, it's a very important point you're raising, which is that if your concerns are that those people who belong to, let's say, scheduled castes and scheduled tribes and even other backward class or OBCs, the reservation policies that our country has introduced over the years somehow compromises and puts those people who may not fall under the category of those reserved uh, caste to be able to get the benefits of education and profession. Is that right? Is that a question? Please sit down. Let me try to answer the question. It's a very important question and it's a fair question. Uh, so the history and context of affirmative action in India, in the US they call it affirmative action. In, uh, in, in India we use the word reservation, is that? The origins of it is actually from the constitution of India itself. The constitution of India, when you study, uh, you will, uh, when you study the VA Legal Studies course, you will introduce the constitution of India. The constitution of India in Article 14 of the Constitution talks about right to equality. In Article 15 and Article 16 of the Constitution specifically talks about different types of schemes and possibly frameworks that will enable people who have been historically discriminated and have been deprived of an opportunity to receive education. How do we give them those rights today? So the idea of any policy relating to affirmative action, the philosophy behind that is how do you deal with historical prejudices, historical oppression? And it is a fact in our country that for thousands of years in this country, Dalits have been discriminated. People who belong to certain castes have been discriminated, deprived of education. Social discrimination has prevailed for centuries in this country. No serious individual contests that. Now the question that we have to discuss, and I want all of you to be like parliamentarians. You are all MPs, and this is a parliament. We have to think, how do we deal with this injustice? Because you have not done this injustice. Many generations ago, people have committed this injustice. And how do you deal with such vast injustice today so that now these people who we are talking about have not received education like how you and I have received education. They have not given the opportunity to go to good schools like you and I have gone to. They have not become competent through the regular process of education to compete like you and I to be able to take the examination and do well in that process. So they are already so deeply situated that if you treat them like you and I, we will inevitably create a sense of injustice because we will be end up we will be ending up treating unequal people equally, which will in fact perpetuate inequality. 
So Article 14, 15, and 16 of the Constitution of India enables the state to create provisions with a view to making sure that those people who have been historically discriminated for whatever reasons need to be brought into the mainstream with a view to empowering them for education and jobs. Of course, in India, the Mandal Commission recommendations essentially implemented this to enable the people who have been talking this in India. However, a very important catch is here. Do those provisions of affirmative action or reservation are never intended to be a permanent solution. Meaning that the hope is at a point of time in society when people who were discriminated in the past can would achieve a certain level in their own journeys, in their own educational and professional journeys, this measure need not continue. That was the vision, Dr. Ambedkar articulated that vision in the Constituent Assembly. Himself had, uh, was part of a, uh, a community which had faced those uh, historical prejudices. Today, this evolution has actually gone into public policy. How many of you know in reservation policy in India, there is a concept of creamy layer? Have you heard of it? There is a concept of creamy layer. This concept of creamy layer is a unique form of public policy intervention to ensure that the benefits of reservation, the benefits of affirmative action, goes only to the most needy people. So, for example, and I am going to give you a very important example. Let's say we, some of you are, we belong to the OBC category. Okay? Now, if you belong to the OBC category, you will normally get reservation in certain contexts. But if your parents are having certain jobs or certain income or certain types of privileges already, you will fall under what is known as a creamy layer. And you will not get the benefit of reservation even though you belong to the OBC category. This is a good example of a public policy intervention that the benefit of reservation should go to only the people who are needy and not to all. Now the controversy that has happened in our country is, or rather it's prevailing is, the creamy layer concept has become applicable only for OBCs and not for SCs and SCs. And there are scholars and others who argue that we need to extend the creamy layer category to SCs and SCs so that, let's say, as a judge of the Supreme Court of India, his son or daughter, he is obviously privileged, the daughter is privileged, should not get the reservation benefit. In the current law, the OBC categories only will have applied the creamy layer. The creamy layer concept does not apply to SCST. So the goal ultimately is, and I want to end by saying, that the goal and objective of any affirmative action is to build a society that is more egalitarian and that fulfills the constitutional goal and promise to build equality. And equality does not mean treating everybody equally. Equality means that you treat relatively equally situated people equally. That also means that if people are inherently unequally situated, you cannot treat them equally because that will amount to perpetuating inequality. And that is the constitutional, legal and moral justification for affirmative action policy or reservation policy. I'll invite my colleague and friend Steve to share a bit about the US experience. Thank you very much. The concepts are somewhat similar, but there's a concept I'd like to introduce that you may not have heard of. It draws on Latin and you'll find that Latin is often used in law. De jure and de facto. Discrimination can be banned by law, 
and that, and when it is banned by law, it is banned de jure. There is equality that is established de jure by the law. But if sociologically people are still excluded in education, housing, um, jobs, and so on, that's called de facto discrimination. So the affirmative action policies that the Vice Chancellor just described that have evolved in India uh, have also undergone a similar evolution in the United States practice. At the time of the adoption of the Civil Rights Act that I referred to you in, in, in 1964, discrimination and segregation were eliminated de jure. But de facto, they still existed. People couldn't get jobs on an equal basis. People didn't get access to education on an equal basis, including to universities like my own. People uh, didn't get access to housing because of the uh, de facto exclusion. And I didn't give credit to somebody else when I was just talking about the influences that led me to this uh, career in using law to try to change the world. My own father, I just occurred to me here in Raj talk about affirmative action, was on the board of the Urban League. The purpose of which was to utilize utilize uh, affirmative action in order to overcome de facto discrimination. Now, Raj is also quite right to encounter the same problem. That may be true for a certain period of time until such time as the historical discrimination is no longer as acute as it was. This is happening in my own university today. You'll find this in the media quite extensively. A lawsuit was uh, brought against Harvard University by a group of uh, Asian uh, activists claiming that East Asian applicants for admission to Harvard were being discriminated against because of Harvard's affirmative action policy. The court has just rendered its judgment uh, in the case and fortunately the affirmative action policy is still in place. But it's a very delicate matter. We do not have reservations in the sense of what we call a quota. So that we say 15% of the students admitted must be African American or Hispanic. But that's the objective we want to achieve. We cannot achieve it by setting quotas. We achieve it by allowing race to be one of the considerations that enters into the broad, complex picture of the selection process. This is what was challenged by Asian students who felt that they were being discriminated against and the affirmative action policy has so far been maintained. But it's the same issue. This is occurring in education, in housing, in access to jobs. How do we find the ways and means of overcoming historical discrimination that takes the form of de facto discrimination today. And we're both confronting the same thing and pursuing it. Fortunately, we are at the stage where we're discussing the details of, um, uh, of, of at, at what point have we done enough. So that means that there's some evidence that progress has been made. But not enough has been made. On this campus, I've heard the use of the term uh, apartheid with respect to allies. So that's something to stop and think about. Is there de facto apartheid today uh, regarding uh, the Dalit population? Is enough being done? This university has a very progressive uh, inclusion policy and has issued a statement on this topic. At this campus, international people have adopted two Sonipat declarations on uh, leadership for the future universities, which have very strong language on the need to ensure access to education, including for persons who are historically uh, deprived access. So, good question. Thank you. Any more questions? More questions here, the side. Oh, please, please. Can I request a silence, please, Bobby?
So don't worry. Sir, how can I change the world with the help of law? For example, the China uh, autonomous country, the struggle is going between Hong Kong and China. How can I with the help of law I can solve that? Uh, one teenage died also in that. Fantastic question. We will answer that. It's a beautiful question. How can we change the world? So how can we change the world?
Please, please, please. Mike is coming. Mike is coming. No, I
in a way that resembles the behavior of authoritarian regimes. Uh, it's a very complex phenomenon that challenges the rule of law. And once again, far too complex to answer in a few words, I would say that it is uh, part of reflecting on changing the world through law to understand what are the constraints on regimes that uh, behave in the way that Brazil or the United States or Russia and China and so on are behaving by having, having charismatic leaders that are exercising their authority in autocratic ways. Um, Guantanamo, no doubt about it. The behavior of the United States in carrying out acts of torture and Guantanamo Bay and primarily for committing the human rights violation of arbitrary arrest and detention and mistreatment of prisoners is a clear violation of international law and constitutes an international crime. Efforts are being taken around the world to prosecute the perpetrators, including senior officials of the United States government, through what is called universal jurisdiction. So study law, and you'll understand what universal jurisdiction is. I don't have time to go into it. So I'll give the, the mic back to Raj and to the other All right, thank you so much, Steve. Um, let me start with uh, the question there. So the right to information question is a very important question. The purpose of the right to information legislation was to improve transparency and accountability of the power holders to be able to share information so that people have informed understanding of what becomes the basis for decision making. Now, unfortunately, governments, regardless of whichever political party is in power, uh, become very uncomfortable when it comes to individual citizens seeking information. So, it's not just this government. Governments before, even the previous government which introduced the right to information legislation, always attempted to bring in amendments so that the RPI becomes less as a tool for people to seek information so that the scrutiny of the citizenry on the functioning of the government and the powers that be is limited. There is no other way other than to constantly be vigilant about it as informed citizenry, as future lawyers but also future enlightened citizenry. We need to be constantly vigilant about these threats be it as members of civil society, media, and other places. In fact, uh, the, the only one aspect of the downside is that unfortunately, whenever you introduce a framework like this, there are always going to be some people who will try to misuse the RTI. And genuinely, there are civil servants and others who at times feel that this becomes a tool for certain amount of abuse as well. And then abuse and the process related to abuse can create a lot of uh, what is known as transactional costs or delays or time on the part of the functioning of the government. But I believe, like you, I share that despite those you know, aspects of disuse, RPI and right to information as a law is the most democratic and impactful and influential pieces of legislation that we've ever had in post digital India and we intend to make it better. The future of course of RPI is that more and more aspects of the government will should become already in public scrutiny. The idea of freedom of information that you don't need to ask it. It's already there. Things are put on the website or things are given away. So more and more information is already shared about how the government takes decisions or how public authorities using powers, then you don't even need the, a powerful RTI because things are already out there. The second question that uh, I think you have is a very important question. Independence of democratic institutions is the foundation of constitutional governance. You cannot develop any form of constitutional governance without assuring independence of institutions. Like, like all of this, we need to recognize that vigilance and eternal vigilance by a vibrant civil society and independent media and also in, you know, young people like you uh, is, a, is the greatest antidote for people who 
who will undermine the autonomy and independence of institutions. Independent institutions have been threatened, but this this threat to independent institutions transcends political parties. And so we need to constantly be vigilant about it. Answering your question, I think uh, your question is a tough one because uh, what do we do when elected governments uh, end up doing things that think is wrong? Well, to begin with, I think we need to invest in what I call, uh, let's say, enlightened, responsible citizenship. We need to have more and more discussions surrounding why we think certain things that governments do are not in the best interest and to engage in a more, in some form of discussion that will ultimately help us in understanding the nature of democracy but also in that process fine tuning it for the future. Because the strength of any democracy is the ability of people to democratically change the government as well. And so, it's the, the idea of this whole engagement is that if we are not satisfied with what any government does, we have to invest in that. We have to talk about it. We have to galvanize social consciousness surrounding it. We need to make people understand why we think that certain policies of the government is not in line with our own aspirations. The only way by which we do, because this is also the only democratic and constitutional way. Any other attempt to do anything in the form of violence or other forms of undemocratic means is also unconstitutional and even more ineffective as well. All right, uh, all right, cover everything before we wind up. Can you check it once again? Ah, CEMI and CBI is the same issue. We talked about independence of institutions. Have I answered all the questions? Have we answered all the questions? Sorry, please. Ah, you missed it. So, can you check it once again? Uh, well, your question is also very, this question is very important. I strongly believe the future of India and to some extent the future of the developing world but also the world at large is going to be shaped by people who have the study and the knowledge and the commitment to the rule of law. The first is as a principle, knowing about the law helps you to become an enlightened and an empowered citizen. But beyond that, the way in which India as a country is growing when it comes to our aspiration to build a five trillion dollar economy where the manufacturing sector the services sector and all our sectors are going to significantly expand and we are going to compete with the best of the world. The, the foundations of that economic future will depend upon our ability to have a strong and effective legal system. The strong and effective legal system to, which will serve as a bulwark for building a social and economic order is going to be based upon laws and legal institutions first. Second, we are increasingly going to move towards a rule of law society where rules and regulations matter. Today, unfortunately in India, rules and regulations are to a large extent, they get violated, laws get violated and people have lesser respect for the rule of law. As we look at the future, we are going to find more and more rules and regulations which will be impacting our life and people will be made accountable for those rules and regulations. Third, we are also moving into a society where the private sector is going to play a very strong role. Just imagine 30, 40 years ago, start looking at what we were, used as we were using as consumer durables or the services that we obtain, it was largely led by the state and the government only, including our you know, aeroplanes to you know, shopping to everything. But today, there's been a tectonic shift. We are moving towards a very strong private sector led, -led development. That means that we need to be conscious of how laws 
will play a very important role because it is possible that the private sector develop, led development can lead to what is in scholarly circles talked about as crony capitalism or in other words to what people will talk about people engaged in greed, in the dominance of greed as an aspect of private sector behavior. That can be only conditioned through law and legal institutions. The fourth is technology. I mean today for example, new situations are emerging in the fields of artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning and you are in many ways we don't know what the future is going to be. Uh, you are an uh, e-commerce generation. You grew up in a time when you could pretty much order things online. Lots of these things are not regulated. They are going to have huge significance. Driverless cars. How many of you know about driverless cars? Imagine when India begins to have driverless cars. Imagine the kind of situation. You know, how, you know B. Swami? How many of you know B. Swami? B. Swami is the owner of Sonipat, right? Imagine in B. Swami there are 20 driverless cars rolling around. Imagine the kind of legal issues that might potentially arise, including the thought of negligence and the kind of legal implications that I would have. So technology and technological advancement is going to create huge opportunities for lawyers. So the kind of expansion of legal services and legal opportunities is going to be mind-boggling. And the fifth is about all these new developments that have emerged will also have implications for privacy, cyber security, threats that are relevant for. So it's, it's not just all these developments are going to be only positive. The negative and adverse impact of this, these developments will need to be conditioned by law, limited by law, regulated by law, and facilitated by law. And that is why the future of legal profession is so strong because who is going to do this? Lawyers are going to do it. Those who have been trained in law are going to do it. Even if you are not a lawyer by the form of having an LLB degree, the knowledge of law in business, in policy, in almost all aspects of careers that you may choose, the knowledge of law will help you to understand and respond to those public policy choices that governments and individuals will have to make. So in a way, I want to summarize the saying, the future of law and legal profession is so bright and so strong and each one of you will play a big role as change agents. So you will change the world through law. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to present uh, a small token of appreciation to my colleague, Professor Stephen Marks, for his lecture. I would like to invite all the teachers who have come from the schools here. Can you please come to the stage? Uh, we would like to present the Dr. Appreciation. All the teachers and mentors, all of you who have come here, can you please come to the stage? We would like to honor all the teachers who have come. Uh, all right, uh, all the students here. So, so, so I want to say this to you, you know, we are, I see this uh, as a part of our, you know, community, fraternity, we are all educators and I must say that teachers are unfortunately in our country least valued, not just by students, students probably think them better, but the larger society do not understand and appreciate the value and importance of teachers. And this non-appreciation of the value and importance of teachers transcends across governments, policy thinking, compensation, appraising, salaries, and it boils down to respect in society. So I want to say this because before I say anything, 
I want to ask a question to all of you. And this question I have asked to every student in the country I have spoken. I have spoken to over 10,000 students across India. And I ask the same question. And I am going to ask the same question to all of you. In front of your teachers. How many of you among the students would like to become a teacher? One, two, four, five. Okay? So approximately there are 300 students in this room. And if I were very generous about this data, 10 of you are wanting to become teachers. The same data is happening, is applicable in Kanyakumari, in Nagaland, in Kashmir, wherever I go, from IIT to IIS, from Doom uh, School to uh, Well Boys, Well Girls to Sanskrit, to Vasant Valley, everywhere I go, the situation is like this. Less than 1%, 2% of the students wanted to become a teacher. Now, the reason I say this is, when you are young, just imagine when you are a first grader, a second grader. If I do the data analysis there, 50% of you or more will aspire to be a teacher. You would have, because your teacher was your idol, your inspiration. Over the years, something happens and something unfortunate happens in the course of our education system. And that is what we want to address. We want you to recognize the extraordinary contribution, the thankless contribution, the huge amount of personal and professional sacrifices that these teachers of you, day in and day out, engage to inspire you, to educate you, to empower you. So give them a loud applause.